want to say welcome to you. If you're comfortable, why don't you stand with us? The way we like to open our services is by creating some intentional space to meet with the Lord through song. So yeah, feel free to stand. We'll sing these songs together as we welcome the Lord's presence in this place. Come Holy Spirit. We're going to teach y'all a new song this morning, okay? Called Because of Your Love. I'm going to sing verse 1. And then verse 2, it's, it's on you, okay? <laughs> You'll do great. No pressure. I am free. No more chains on me. Your love has rescued me. I am free. Here's the chorus because of your love. Because of your love, I am born again. I am born again. Because of your love, and you are good. Your love and mercy have no end. You're closer than. Good. You are the You can have your way with me How far will as you be You are the song, feel free to sing this with us. God, we do. We welcome your presence here, Lord. We ask that you would call us to life. with me. There's only one name. There's only one name. There is only one name with power to save. With power to save. Sing this. 
hands one more time together for Jesus. That was great. So good morning. My name is Eric Gonzalez. I am the life empowerment pastor here at Vineyard Columbus, but I also work with our Vinya community here at Westerville. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now, I would like to say welcome to everyone that is new here to Vineyard Columbus. Um, we are a multi-site church, which means that we have different communities getting together to be part of our service here um, at Vineyard Columbus. Can you guys put your hands together for them as well? Thank you for visiting us. Part of our mission statement here is that we want to partner with Christ to heal the world. And many of you guys... You probably all have heard about the hurricane that hit Florida in several of our states. The report came back that over 100 people have deceased because of this hurricane, and there was a lot of destruction. What we want to do is we already have a partnership with Convoy of Hope, and we want to come alongside with them to bring some relief and help. Um, here in a second, we're going to pick up the offering, and by you giving today, we will be donating $50,000 to Convoy of Hope to help in different ways that we can't. We're also going to pray for the people that um, need the prayer um, in this season down in Florida, or just down south. So um, here in a second, we're going to be giving. One of the way, different ways you can give here at Vineyard Columbus is by texting the word GIVE to 98977. But you can also give the old-fashioned way. Uh, there's going to be the uh, ushers will be coming around with the bags, and you can deposit your money there. So I'd like to invite you to just bow your heads with me, and let's just invite the Holy Spirit. So Lord, we thank you. We invite you to come. Lord, we invite you to just be with the people that um, need comfort at this time because of the hurricane, Lord. Lord, we not only ask for healing, but we just ask that, you, that people may be filled with their presence and that they can feel you near to them in this very moment, Lord. We pray for the giving today. We ask that you multiply it. 
We ask that you continue to use it to bless others. In Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Amen. Now, again, if you might be new here, we'd love to connect with you, uh, or you have been coming for a little bit and you haven't gotten connected. We'd like to invite you to text the word hi to 98977, and please fill out the form that is sent to you. By you filling out this form, uh, we donate $5 to an organization here at in Columbus um, to further be a blessing to our city, a friend to our city. Um, Or if not, we'd like to invite you to what we call Welcome to Vineyard. Uh, Welcome to Vineyard is a space where we get together, we connect, you get to meet some of our pastors. Um, The next one's going to happen August, I don't think August 11th, because August 11th was a while ago, October 11th. October 11th, well, the next one is coming up soon, and we would like for you guys to get connected. Please check out our info desk. As a matter of fact, we have a lot of different activities happening uh, here at this church, and that's just a good way to plug in. Um, Let them know I sent you there. Um, Let's see, what else? Uh, We would like to invite all of our middle schoolers to head to their classes. So please feel free to stand up and head to your classes. And during this time, can you guys help me welcome our speaking pastor today, Ms. Julia Pickerel. Give her a hand. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys today. Uh, I do want to welcome all of our campus communities. So we are a church of campuses. So good morning over at Sawmill, at Pickerington, at Grandview. Uh, Hola, buenos dias to our Vina Columbus, to Pastor Irene and Pastor Daniel. Uh, We are all around in different parts of the city, sometimes different days, but it's really lovely that we get to worship together. I want to give just a Uh, an additional thank you for those of you who give generously to Vineyard Columbus. What you allow us to do is in moments of great crisis and need, have restricted funds that are available for us to immediately give a significant amount of assistance to Convoy of Hope. Convoy is our partner. Uh, When we do disaster relief, Convoy is a remarkable organization. If you're not familiar with them, I'd encourage you to uh, take a look for Convoy of Hope online. But again, just this week, you, out of your generosity, were able to give their organization $50,000. They are very often the first on the ground. They are the last to leave. It's praise God indeed. So thank you so much for allowing Vineyard Columbus to be a general or a generous church. We are going to continue our series on healing today. And I want to start with a quick review of last week. Then I want to offer us a little bit of a worldview to think through. And finally, we're going to take a look at Mark chapter 5. And I'm going to have us notice five things from the text about that particular story of healing in Scripture. So first, let me review. If you remember from last week, uh, you were maybe taught that when Jesus began his ministry, where did he go? Did he go to the biggest, most exceptional, coolest city where all of the influencers were? No, he went to Galilee, which to you means almost nothing. And I thought of myself about naming a small Ohio town that might be like Galilee, but then I figured somebody here probably lives there and I don't want to offend anyone. So think about that kind of small backwater town that no one would go to to do anything. Jesus started his extraordinary ministry in an incredibly ordinary place. It's the first thing I want us to remember. The second thing that I want us to remember is that Jesus' ministry of healing was holistic. Body, mind, spirit, soul. Jesus did not just come to save our souls for heaven one day and we just have to suck it up between now and then. 
His healing for us was holistic, meaning he demonstrated a care for people's minds, their bodies, their spirits, their relationships, their integration into community, their purposes. And the reason that it's important that we understand that Jesus is healing as being holistic is because the third uh, thing that I want us to reflect on is that Jesus is healing was a demonstration of something much, much, much bigger. His healing was a demonstration of his larger mission to heal the world. Jesus came and said, the kingdom of God is at hand. And all of the episodes of healing that we see through the New Testament are wonderful in and of themselves. But as the kids today would say, they are the receipts that Jesus is offering because he says, I have come to restore everything, not just the one thing. I have come to take this world in which there is trouble and a lot of bad news, Jesus says, and I have come to make all things right. And his demonstrations of all sorts of different kinds of healing in the New Testament are the way that he begins to open us up to the fact that he has the power to do that. Those are the three things that I want us to notice. In the book of Luke, we read that Jesus, who at this point is kind of a young guy, he's not very important, dad's a carpenter, but he likes to hang out in the temple a lot. He's a little bit of a know-it-all. He shows up and he opens up the scroll and he begins to read a text. Here's the text that Jesus reads. Some of you are familiar. It's a text out of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Jesus reads this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is reading this. He's a young dude. Nobody really knows him. He's the son of a carpenter. And he's like... He's making a radical claim about who he is in the world. I have come, he says, to take all that is wrong and make it right. So in the New Testament talks about healing and about salvation and about deliverance. The Greek word that we come to very often is the Greek word sozo. It's the word that exemplifies being set free from all that is wrong, being delivered from all that holds us captive. And the word sozo is predicated on another Greek word that doesn't just mean to be saved, it means to be safe. I love this. Jesus comes into the world and he says, I have not just come to save you, I have come to make you safe. Safe in your mind, safe in your relationships, safe in your society. I have come to a world that is full of bad news to bring good news. This is what Jesus says to us. I came to make all things right. His claim was not simply, y'all go to church, pretend like everything's okay, and one day when you're dead, some good's going to happen. That is not the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And then he demonstrates it through powerful, holistic healing, and then he says to us, follow me. That's why we're doing this series. Today, we're going to talk about a very particular story that has to do with healing for a troubled mind. Like we said, Jesus' healing is holistic mind, body, spirit, relationships. Today, we're going to talk about a story of healing of a troubled mind. Would you pray with me as we begin? Lord, we do recognize all over our world there is uh, much bad news. And God, we pray your power on all of those who are working to partner with you to bring healing. God, we pray for folks in places uh, that are just devastated for a myriad of reasons. 
And we ask, Lord, that you would put your power, that, that the little that we are able to give towards doing good in the world would be multiplied and used for your glory, God. Would you relieve? Would you rescue? Would you draw people to you, Lord? Would you make people safe who need to be made safe? God, we pray your protection over our world and our politics and all the powers that be. God, we ask that you would be sovereign over all and that you would remind us of your goodness and your power in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so healing for a troubled mind. What I first want to do is talk about what I'm not talking about when I talk about a troubled mind, particular to this text in Mark chapter five. The first uh, thing that sometimes we think about when we think about our minds, or you hear the expression troubled mind, is you might think about things related to emotional well-being, emotional health, uh, mental health, mental illness perhaps. That, that is a broad category of what we think about very often when we think about our minds. Another category that you might think of when we think about our minds is just our mental functionality. This has to do with our mental capacity. Sometimes people uh, are, are managing in different times of life with things like dementia. We have uh, all sorts of categories of functionality with our minds that might come to mind. These are the two categories that I'm not talking about today, all right? I want to be really clear. But they're very important things that we have to sort of engage with as followers of Jesus. So while I'm not talking about them today, what I'm not saying is those aren't areas where we do so often need myriad healing from the Lord, uh, particularly for those of you who are particularly curious about the first category, and maybe you're somebody who is suffering from a mental illness, a diagnosis. I've told you before, I have a diagnosis of depression. It is medically managed. How is it that we think about these things as Christians? Because a lot of times as Christians, the way we think about it is we're just supposed to pray it all away and pretend it isn't there. Okay, but that's not what we do. So if you're curious about that conversation, uh, there's a message that I preached earlier this year that is very specific to mental health, mental well-being, mental illness that I'd love for you to listen to. We've posted that on our This Week page, um, but I'm not going to uh, cover that today. What I am going to talk about today is a kind of spiritual distress that we see in Scripture a mental affliction that has a, a, a spiritual component to it. We're going to go back to a story in the New Testament where Jesus is with his disciples and he's encountered someone who has a spiritual affliction of the mind. This is Mark chapter 5. Jesus has just traveled with his disciples by boat over the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Gerasenes. Now, keep in mind, Jesus was in Galilee, nowhere town. Then he crosses the, uh, to the other side, nowhere town. No one seems to understand why Jesus took these detours, why he didn't go to the famous and fabulous places. But anyways... He gets there, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from the message version of this text to make it as understandable as possible. He encounters a troubled man who has a troubled mind that is troubled by a spiritual affliction. The text that we're going to read refers to this person as madman. I hope that's a word that we would never use. The Greek word is a katharto, it means unclean spirit. The, the picture is Jesus comes across a man and this man is described as being out of sorts, as being spiritually afflicted. Another way that you can think about this is it's as though he is an untended garden is what the text tells us. He's separated, he's isolated. And here's what we read. As Jesus got out of the boat, a madman from the cemetery came up to him. Now this seems like a very small line, but let's keep a few things in mind. Jesus is immediately greeted by a troubled man who has an afflicting spirit. 
Not only does he have an afflicting spirit that's affecting him uh, in his behavior, as you'll see, but he's completely isolated from culture. He's completely isolated from family, completely isolated from society. He lives in a cemetery. The man lived in the cemetery there among the tombs and graves. No one could restrain him. He couldn't be chained. He couldn't be tied down. He had been tied up many times with chains and ropes, but he broke the chains. He, he snapped the ropes. No one was strong enough to tame him. Night and day, he roamed through the graves in the hills, screaming out and slashing himself with sharp stones. Jesus comes across a troubled man with a troubled mind. This is someone's son, someone's brother, perhaps someone's father. Now, we would say he is a threat to himself and to others, and perhaps in our sort of modern way, if we came across this particular person, we might say, gosh, this person seems to be suffering delusions, or they're in the midst of a psychosis or a mania, and, and he's alone, he's unmanageable, he's isolated, he's traumatized. And this is very true. It's a, it's a picture of a person that Jesus meets for whom there is no good news. Now, in our modern world, what we would often say is, well, this person needs uh, an immediate intake and great clinical care and medical management. And l hear me out on this. That very well may be true. If you have ever been to the developing world where they do not have access to the kinds of medicines that you and I can buy in the store, my friends, we are foolish if we do not think that the kind of medical uh, management that we can receive is not the grace of God for us. That we would think it is not a part of his miraculous healing in the whole world, right? And, and there's something else happening in this text. This, this text demonstrates to us really clearly and we'll see it in a moment that this man is experiencing a spiritual affliction. Now let me be really clear. Scripture does not imply at all that the primary reason for the sorts of sort of mental and emotional struggles that we have has this underlying nature of a spiritual affliction. Okay, some of us were taught that, that everything can just be prayed away. Here's what I'm saying. If you have diabetes, pray that God would, take, or would heal your diabetes and take your medicine for diabetes. If you have bipolar 2, pray that God would heal you and take your medicine. It's God's grace for you. Okay? So we're not going to let go of attention here. But what we are going to say is that this person in Scripture has a spiritual affliction. So let me offer us a biblical worldview for which to think about this before we go further. In our post-enlightenment world, we tend to demythologize everything, right? So it's like, think about it. What you believe to be true is usually what you can see, what you can measure. That's what the enlightenment taught us. Everything is knowable by observation. And so if you are one of these people who tends to demythologize everything, then what you often do when you read a text like this is you say to yourself, that's not really what it means. What it really means is my brother needed some medical management. Now, the problem with that is that that's not what the text says. Okay, so the ancients and Jesus as well saw the world as completely intertwined, the spiritual and the natural. They understood that the world was completely commingled between those two things. And they believed that there were forces of darkness and forces of good. And let's not have our post-enlightenment bias hats on where we're just like, well, that was in the old days. Because the reality is, is the more that we understand about things like science, the more we understand that not everything is measurable or observable. There is mystery in this world. Ask someone to explain quantum entanglement to you. So what Jesus understood is this. Not only do we live in a world where we can see evidence of entropy and despair and brokenness and sin, 
things that need to be healed. Not only are those things a part of our observable world, they are also a part of powers and principalities, Scripture says, the spiritual world. So what a biblical worldview does is it holds some tension. The first thing that we need to remember to have a biblical worldview in this conversation is that every human being is made in the image of God and we're designed to reflect God's rule and stewardship of his kingdom, right? But into that, there was a break. So everything, all of creation, our bodies, our minds, our souls, our relationships, our, our created order is all impacted by the break of sin. And where we live is in between the now and the not yet of that. God's kingdom is here. It is not yet fully here. So there are powers and principle, principalities. There is, as our founding pastor, Rich Nathan, used to say, there's another team on the field in the spiritual realm. So that's our biblical worldview. Let's drop back into the text. When this man saw Jesus a long way off, which interestingly always reminds me of a line from the story of the prodigal son. A long way off. The man ran and bowed in worship before Jesus. Then he howled in protest, what business do you have, Jesus, son of the high God, messing with me? I swear to God, don't give me a hard time. Jesus had just commanded the tormenting spirit, out, get out of the man. We're going to notice five things in this text, all right? Thing number one is incredibly important. Did you notice how normal Jesus is? Y'all didn't even notice that he prayed. His prayer for deliverance is literally a parenthetical note in the text. Like if you literally, it's like in parentheses. Like, oh, by the way, he prayed this way. You know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't grab a microphone and start screaming deliverance over the dude. He didn't round all of his friends up and be like, get in a circle and pray it away and humiliate the man. Okay, did he do any of that? No. Did he start jumping up and down, singing religious songs, getting all like wild and crazy for his YouTube followers? No, he did none of those things. He was profoundly normal. Thing one, to notice, Jesus is super normal. Thing two, is that this spiritual affliction, this unclean spirit, had to acknowledge and submit to Jesus. In other words, Jesus was in control, which is probably why he could be so normal. Here's an important thing for us to understand, Christians, when we talk about things like spiritual warfare, and we talk about, I mean, this is kind of like, let's just be honest, it's a little bit on the weird side of church, right? When we talk about these things, what's really important to understand is that there are not two equal and opposite teams on the field. There is one team that has won the day. There is another team that is walking off the field, trash talking and throwing stuff. But there are not two equal and opposite teams on the field. What this means is that Jesus says, my power defeated your power. Now all I have to do is make a little parenthetical comment. And guess what? You can be safe. Okay? Jesus was in control. The third thing that I want you to understand is that the spiritual condition in the situation was clear. This person identified themselves as clearly an adversarial and oppositional spirit to Jesus Christ. And then we'll see in a moment, they actually name themselves. Now there are some spiritual traditions that try to proactively identify or sort of like make up a thought that like everyone around me has got a spirit. That can be dangerous. It's often wrong. And it can actually be spiritually abusive. What we never do, friends, is pretend to know things that we cannot know when we're in this kind of space. So let me be really clear. I never want to hear about folks at Vineyard Columbus, you know, casting a demon out of someone because they sinned. Or praying for deliverance for like a young child who's a little bit out of order. Like these things happen. Sometimes we're taught that this is a normal way of relating to uh, spiritual realities. It, it's, it's not the case in scripture, okay? In this case, 
In this text, this man's spiritual condition was incredibly clear. And it was demonstrated by his clear adversarial nature towards Jesus. Verse 9, Jesus asked him, what's your name? He replied, and this is the afflicting spirit, my name is Mob, I'm a rioting mob. Then he desperately begged Jesus not to banish them from the country. This word mob is um, translated from the Greek as legion, meaning the legion of an army. This man identifies the spiritual affliction that he has, and he says it's, it's a mob. It's a legion. And again, we see a person who is suffering. And the fourth thing I want you to notice is that Jesus' response to suffering is always compassion. You can read through the whole of the New Testament and find that the most common emotional word used to describe Jesus' response to suffering is compassion. It's not judgment. It's not intensity. It's compassion. Oh, he is not safe. Now things are going to get a little weirder, maybe a lot. Kind of depends on your bar. <laughs> Verse 11, a large herd of pigs. Remember, this is the countryside. They just crossed over Galilee, They're kind of in like some large fields, and there's a large herd of pigs, and they're grazing and rooting on a nearby hill, and over here you have Jesus and this man, and there's a cemetery nearby. It's kind of far away from the town. The, the demons, these unclean spirits in the man begged him, begged Jesus, send us to the pigs so that we can live in them. Jesus gave the order, and he's in control and super normal. But it was even worse for the pigs than for the man. Crazed, they stampeded over a cliff into the sea and drowned. Aren't you so glad I'm preaching on this text today? <laughs> Me too. Those tending the pigs, as I think we all would, uh, became scared to death. <laughs> they bolted and told their story in town and country. Everyone wanted to see what happened. Duh. They came up to Jesus and saw the madman sitting there wearing decent clothes and making sense, no longer a walking madhouse of a man. Those who had seen it told the others what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs. At first they were in awe, and then they were upset, upset over the drowned pigs. They're expensive, I gather. They demanded that Jesus leave and not come back. They were in awe, they got upset, and then they decided to ignore so here's what I'm guessing you're noticing from this text. I'm guessing you're like, what is up with the pigs? And the jumping off of the cliff and the drowning business. That's weird. And that's what everybody else around here noticed. But I think it's not the most important thing to notice. The final thing I want us to notice is that Jesus restored this man in both mind and relationship. That's the most important part of the story. Now, Jesus is sitting with this guy in relationship with him. They've gotten him taken care of physically. He's clothed. He's in conversation. He, he's not just healed of an afflicting spirit. He's been healed in a much broader sense. Now, I'm a mom. So I read this text from a mom's point of view. I don't read it from like I'm having a Bible study point of view or a, a New Testament scholar point of view or even a swine theologian point of view. What I notice as a mom is that my son who has been lost has now been found. What I notice as a mom is that this experience that I didn't understand and had no control over has been made safe. And what I notice is all of a sudden where there was nothing but bad news, there is now good news that there is an entirely different kind of kingdom and power at work in this world. 
That's what I notice. My son is safe. Verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, so all of this has happened. Jesus and his disciples are getting back. They're uh, getting ready to set sail on the Sea of Galilee. And isn't it interesting? Let's just take this as an aside. There's really no reason for Jesus to go to Galilee or to this little region across the sea. There's really no other reason. And there is a part of me that wonders. If Jesus doesn't only go to ordinary places, but he goes to the most hidden of ordinary places. It's a cemetery across the sea from a nowhere town. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the demon-delivered man begged to go along, but Jesus wouldn't let him. He said, go home to your own people, tell them your story, what the master did, how he had mercy on you. The man went back and began to preach in the ten towns area about what Jesus had done for him. He was the talk of the town. This man who had been made safe by Jesus pleads to stay with him. The crowds, as they always do, they go away. They're literally worried about the price of their herd of dead pigs. They've forgotten this miraculous thing that had happened. And then Jesus tells this man, you can't come with me. I know you feel safe with me, but I've made you safe because I've also given you a purpose. And what is the purpose of this man? I love this. Jesus does not say, go everywhere and tell them about my power. He doesn't say, go everywhere and tell them that I won. He doesn't say, go everywhere and tell them that I am victorious. He says, go everywhere and tell them about my mercy. Yeah, my mercy. Why is it that Jesus rescues? It's because he's merciful. Ours is a merciless world, my friends. We live in a merciless world. Good news is usually not for the poor. The oppressed usually get more oppressed. The marginalized usually get more marginalized. You know who gets favor? Those who can buy it. And they don't live in Galilee. The kingdom of God is different. The Lord is gracious, the psalmist says. Slow, I'm sorry, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are all over his works. When we talk about the healing work of Jesus in our world. We are talking about a God who chooses to reveal himself in the most plain and ordinary of spaces to the most plain and desperate of people because of his mercy. And every time he does that in the singular, What's happening is that there's another signpost of the kingdom of God that gets set up and that tells us, look, I have come to overcome the world. And not only does Jesus proclaim that, he demonstrates it through his healing. Now in just a moment, I'm going to release us to ministry time, and in just a moment, campuses, I'll release you. Not quite yet, but our campus pastors, you can start making your way up to the front so that we're prepared for ministry time together. But um, let me end with this. We have covered a lot of ground in Mark chapter 5, talking about healing for troubled minds. And my guess is, because I know most people, that most of us are most comfortable in extremes, right? That's where we tend to, tend to be, most of us. And, and so some of you are listening to this text and you're like, well, that's weird. I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> right? I mean, do you ever, you, we, we do that in our Bibles all the time. We're like, yep, nope, not going to do that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying everybody does it except for the one of you who's offended at that joke. Um, 
<laughs> but, but here's the thing. A lot of us, I would say, you know, many of us are tempted to demythologize a text like this. And we're just tempted to put an enlightenment filter over it. I totally get that. Um, the problem is it's not what the text says. Okay. Then on the other hand, there are some of us who come from faith traditions that have just, they've taught you to let go of the tension. They've taught you to let go of the now and the not yet. And you're, you're like casting demons out of your car because your car broke down. You're casting demons out of your sister because she's dating some guy you don't like. You're casting demons out of your landlord because the guy wants his rent. You know, um, what else? You're like powers and principalities around the voting booths. I don't know what y'all are doing, but my point is this, like that's not a picture either of an integrated biblical worldview, okay? So, but, but that's where we slide, right? So what I'm telling you is you prob, I know you all think I am the balanced one in the room. I am the, I am the sane one, Julia. Uh -huh. And what I'm saying to you is that like maybe you lean to one side or the other. Okay, and if that's us, then our work then is to lean, lean to the different way, okay? To lean to this space of having an integrated worldview, to be a people of faith that hold the same tensions that we see in scripture. I mean, this is our work. Human beings are made in the image of God. All of creation has been interrupted by sin. And the holistic healing that Jesus demonstrated and that he told his disciples and followers to participate in is a sign of the redemptive work of God in the world. Now, this is a tension that we have to hold and a teaching that we have to understand intentionally. And so I'll close with this, a reminder, this is why we do things like the healing conference that we're doing at the end of the month. We're flying in Alexander Fenter. He's a vineyard OG from South Africa. It's the last weekend of October, Friday, Saturday night at seven, Sunday morning across all campuses, simulcast like we are right now, Sunday night, all student night, only for the students at Westerville campus. Okay, it is important. Listen, my friends. We live in a merciless world. And we live in a world right now that is troubled and unsafe. I think we as followers of Jesus would find it wise to set aside some intentional time to come together to be equipped to be encouraged and to be taught. How is it that we walk out this way of healing in the world? So I hope that you join us the end of October. Now, campuses, let me pray a blessing over all of us and then I'll release you to local ministry time. Would you just pray with me for a moment? Father God, we pray that you would help us grow in faith, in hope, and in love. Would you deposit just an increase of your spirit with us, Lord? We want to see more of you at all of our campuses, God. We want to see more of your power, more of your healing, Lord. Make us like children who aren't afraid to ask for more. Would you bless us today in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Campuses, I'm going to release you now for your ministry time. And uh, here at Westerville, and for those of you who are online, we're going, to, we're going to do ministry time a little bit different today. Instead of inviting you to come forward, you know, I've, I just feel keenly aware. I mean, you know, first of all, Mark chapter 5, it is a funny little text. You've got the pigs and the drowning and the spiritual affliction. It's also a really profound text because you have a person who's unsafe and unwell. And then you have this compassion of Jesus. And one of the things that I think so often as followers of Jesus that we need to do, um, well, it's not what we need to do. 
It's what we need to receive. What we really need to receive over and over and over are the comforting words of our merciful Father God, who when we are a long way off, or when you are a long way off, or for some of you when your kids are a long way off, or your grandkids are a long way off, or your dad's a long way off, or whoever it is, they're just, they're a long way off and they're troubled for whatever reason. What we need to do is to reposition ourselves to be filled with the truth of who Jesus is, his power in our life, and the work that he's doing to not just save us, but to make us safe. So, for many of you, it's been a long, full week. What I'm going to invite us to do as we close is just to stay seated. If you're at home, you can just dial in. And I want you to listen as this, uh, as this song is sung over you. Listen to these words, to the words of Jesus spoken to us. And for those of you who do have someone in your life that feels a long way off, and you don't know, is it spiritual affliction? Is it mental illness? Is it choices? Like, you don't even know what it is, but they're, they're a troubled person in a troubled place. If you hold someone like that close to you, just you know, put your hand over your heart, in your hand in your lap just as a sign of like Lord would you please like the Lord goes to just far off places so your prayer can be Lord would you go to this far off place and find them this is how we're going to end our service and then in a moment we'll take communion with one another God bless you when you pass through the waters I will be with and the depths of the river shall not overwhelm when you walk through the fire Thank you.
I'd like to invite everyone to stand as we take communion. Now this is a really um, special moment that we all get to take together as we remember the words of our Lord Jesus. But before we take communion, I want to invite you, if you haven't made Jesus your Lord, we're going to take a moment and pause and I want to give you the opportunity, the invitation to release your life to him. Jesus so died for you and me, so loved us that he died on that cross for you and me. I just want to give you the opportunity to just, during this pause, take the moment, close your eyes, and just surrender to him. So let's do that right now. the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Feel free to take the bread. In the same way, after he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You may take the cup. Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that we all got to partake this moment. Lord, we pray for those that have surrendered their life to you. We ask that you continue to bless us. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone says, amen. Now, I have a couple of announcements for us before we end. Uh, we have our small group fair going on. Can you guys give a hand to all the small group leaders? Yeah. Out in the lobby, we want to invite you to check out the fair. We have all different small groups. If you are 55 plus years old, uh, we will be meeting by the coffee area. So please feel free to head that way. Um, I also want to remind all of us and kind of hype us up a little bit. Our Holy Spirit Conference is happening at the end of this month, the 25th through the 27th. Come on, yeah. We have um, Alexander Venter. He is um, one of the theologians for Vineyard coming in from South Africa. He wrote the book, Doing Healing, Doing Church. Feel free to check out the bookstore for some of his material, but he will be our keynote speaker here. Come with expectancy. We know that God is gonna move. He's gonna do something super powerful. Uh, I also want to invite everyone, if you want to partake and be part of our ministry team, uh, October 20th, after the services, we will have our Vineyard Core Lab. You must take this lab to be part of the team or just to be trained up in the way we do ministry here at Vineyard Columbus. So feel free to check that out. We'd love for you guys to gather with us. I will also be doing retrainings at the end of each service in the EL rooms. Feel free to hit us there. So um, hit us up there. Don't hit us. Hit us up there. So let me pray to just end and then we can all and uh, go out and just have a fun time. So Lord, thank you for today. I ask for a blessing for each and every person that has gathered with us. We thank you for everything in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Bless you guys.